everyone, this is the Iowa City work session for September 7th, 2021. And we have all of our counselors here. We have our student liaisons from, oh, great, from um, USG. We're gonna start with our first item, which is a staff presentation of recommendations on priority programs for the American Rescue Plan Act funds. And we're gonna welcome our city manager, Jeff Ruin. All right, thank you, Mayor. Good to see everybody here uh, this afternoon. We're very excited to be uh, talking about the American Rescue Plan Act again. It's been a couple of months since the council has uh, last had an update. And as you know, we've been busy the last month or two uh, with some public input. So um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, Rachel Kilberg, the assistant city manager, is going to assist me with this presentation tonight. So what we're gonna do tonight uh, we're going to start with just a very brief review of the American Rescue Plan Act. We're going to talk a little bit about what we've done this past year in terms of um, relief efforts through the CARES Act and local funding as well. Uh, Rachel's going to provide an initial uh, uh, overview of our public input efforts uh, these last couple of months. And then I'm going to present some very high level recommendations uh, to you. Uh, in order to help us uh, move forward. And, and finally, you'll have a chance to discuss those recommendations and provide staff with any direction on how we are going to move forward uh, tonight. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel, who's gonna walk you through uh, a brief overview of the American Rescue Plan Act. Yeah, I'll just uh, do a quick kind of refresher. So as you recall, the legislation um, was passed in March of 2021. And it, the American Rescue Plan Act is an expansive $1.9 trillion federal COVID relief bill that encompassed um, funding for a variety of different programs. This included the $1,400 uh, stimulus checks that went to qualifying individuals, additional um, unemployment benefits were part of this bill, more supplemental funding, funding for other federal programs such as housing, public transit, um, food security benefits, and then a large portion of the bill, of course, went to um, accelerating availability of the vaccine. But what we're focusing on tonight is that $350 billion in state and local fiscal recovery funds, which is direct entitlement funds that were delivered to every city and state uh, in the country. So as you recall, of those funds, Iowa City has received $18.3 million. Um, other kind of notable allocations in the area, Johnson County has received just over $29 million, and both Coralville and North Liberty have both been allocated around $3 million. So as a reminder, these funds are delivered in two phases. So Iowa City received our first um, half in May, just over $9 million. And we expect that we'll receive that second half of funding in May of 2022, so next May. And then the spending deadline, in terms of spending deadlines, we'll have until the end of December of 2024 to um, obligate or encumber the funds, basically to commit what we're gonna spend those funds on. And then the end of December of 2026 to actually have all those funds spent out. So again, I'll do another quick reminder here of those eligible uses. If you recall, there were these four broad um, eligible expenditure categories written into the law, and the U.S. Treasury has, through both their final rule and supplemental guidance that they've been um, periodically updating, they have further clarified, defined, and um, provided examples of what would and would not be eligible expenses within these four broad categories. So this first one, respond to the pandemic's public health and economic impacts. This is the most expansive and encompassing of the categories. Many of the ideas that we heard throughout this first phase of public input fell into this category. It, it, it can contain everything from childcare to business support to vaccine incentives. Um, so that's, that's probably the big category. The second one, premium pay for eligible workers performing essential work. The US Treasury does define both eligible workers and essential work. They also provide some recommendations um, a city might consider if they were to go this route um, for spending the funds. Third, replacing lost revenue and restoring governmental service levels. Again, the Treasury provides a specific methodology, a specific calculation for how you calculate lost revenue. Um, and any lost revenue that is replaced, uh, there's pretty broad latitude for how it can be used. And then finally, this fourth one, necessary water, stormwater, wastewater, and broadband infrastructure projects. 
any other infrastructure projects unless they could somehow be tied to another category listed here um, would not be eligible. So that's all I'm going to kind of cover. I don't want to dive into the weeds anymore in the guidance and compliance portion um, of the ARPA funds. I just wanted to remind you of these four of this kind of overarching framework um, and remind you that as um, spending decisions are made, we'll have to further vet it through that more detailed treasury guidance. But for now, I'll pass it back to Jeff. He's going to talk a little bit about pandemic relief um, that has occurred in our community. Okay, so throughout the pandemic, the city has uh, worked with our partners to bolster uh, local relief efforts. And this has involved using federal funds, state and local funds to stand up new programs that have provided housing assistance, funds for basic household needs, uh, support for new and non, uh, ongoing nonprofit services, as well as small business grants uh, targeted at those businesses that struggle to access some of the early federal business support programs. You can see the list on the screen there. Um, again, some of these are, are federally funded through the city and others are locally funded. Um, several of them are still ongoing, meaning that we are still providing uh, services through our uh, nonprofit partners. In total, we've allocated close to $2 million in new relief efforts over this past year, with approximately half of that going to emergent housing needs in the community. Uh, many of these programs are ongoing and thus the numbers you see at the bottom of the screen in terms of uh, the impact of these programs continues to grow as more and more are assisted. And I want to again stress that while the city was the recipient of these funds and, and helped create these programs, we really executed them through partnerships in our community, through uh, mostly the, the nonprofit community, and they deserve a lot of credit for being able to stand up and administer these programs. Uh, on our behalf and for, for our community. And I think we're going to continue to rely on those partnerships uh, uh, as we move into the ARPA discussions with you uh, in the coming months. I do want to talk about uh, one other partnership that we have, and it's something that we've talked a lot about early on with ARPA, and that's our, our partnership with Johnson County. And I want to highlight one of the initiatives that they undertook this past month. Using $2 million in federal funds, uh, they, were, they uh, were able to supplement their general assistance program, which has an annual budget of just around $500,000. they have increased eligibility to include undocumented persons. They've expanded income eligibility to make more persons eligible for general assistance. They've expanded the list of eligible expenses. And they've eliminated the rent cap and increased the duration of the assistance uh, time period. Uh, we expect usage for this expanded program to continue to grow as word gets out uh, throughout Johnson County. And I've uh, heard multiple times from the county that they're going to be certainly watching it closely and that they're committed to being flexible as they uh, look at the impact of these uh, enhancements that they've made to the general assistance program. Uh, my understanding is that they, the $2 million that they are using to supplement this program is from uh, previous relief efforts, so probably the CARES Act dollars and not the ARPA dollars. As we begin to make expenditures on uh, decisions on expenditures, I'm going to really strongly advocate that we try to partner with general assistance as much as we can. I think it increases uh, a number of efficiencies and ultimately will help the households uh, that access that program by helping connect them with other resources as well. So keep that in mind as you really, as you dive into eligible uses and how you want to use our funds. Uh, let's, let's really keep this program in mind and see if there's uh, opportunities for partnership with Johnson County. And then you'll hear me say this a couple of times tonight. Um, we really uh, have to keep in mind that we are not making our decisions uh, alone in a vacuum. Uh, there are a lot of other components of ARPA that are still being uh, worked out. Uh, local governments have not made expenditure decisions to date, nor has the state of Iowa. Other federal programs that are coming out of ARPA are still being rolled out and having rules drafted. So, for example, we know that uh, we'll receive approximately $1.7 in homeless assistance dollars through a supplemental home allocation that's coming through ARPA. Those rules are under development, and we'd expect those to be published later this fall or in the winter. Those rules, as well as the decisions made by other governing, governing bodies, may influence how we choose to deploy funds. So we want to make sure that we remain uh, flexible in how, we, uh, in, in how we begin to move forward. All right, I'm going to turn it over uh, 
to Rachel, who's going to just walk through the public input process that we've been through the last uh, month or two. Yeah, so since we are receiving our ARPA funds in two phases and we have about five years to spend the funds, we obviously know that ongoing public input will be necessary, especially as you start to make spending decisions and the projects and programs are refined. Um, but the Treasury's guidance is really clear that a robust public input process is necessary for compliance. So as you know, in June, we presented our initial public input plan to you all uh, for your approval, and then in July, we launched those efforts. This slide here just shows um, an overview of, of all that we've done over these past two months or so. Um, as a reminder to both City Council and the public who's watching, everything that we heard through all of these methods um, on the slide here uh, was available in a summarized list in um, the memo from last week's information packet. It's also posted online at icgov.org slash ARPA. But I, like I said, I'm just going to uh, highlight a couple here. So these first two, um, our online survey, we made it available in Spanish, Spanish, French, Arabic, and English. We also created an informational flyer in these same languages. We disseminated that to um, local nonprofits so they could help kind of expand our reach and reach more individuals. Um, likewise, with our email, we really encourage people to respond using their preferred language, and then we would translate on the back end um, so it wasn't a, a further barrier to them. We held an in-person listening session, hung out at the farmer's market to hear some ideas, and we've been collaborating with Johnson County as they are undertaking their really robust input process as well to hear what they're hearing uh, within our community. A couple of organizations that I do um, want to specifically call out and thank. We were really fortunate for the opportunity to attend the diversity market. Uh, Jeff and I attended, and we were able to speak directly with the vendors, hear a little bit more about what their needs are uh, to continue to grow and support their businesses. Also spoke with uh, some visitors who were there enjoying the market. We also appreciated um, that Open Heartland hosted us. They uh, connected us to some local residents in need, so we were able to hear how the pandemic has impacted them, and they provided translation services for us. And then we also want to thank the excluded workers for hosting us at St. Patrick's Church. They also provided translation services and arranged for us to hear some stories, again, from local residents and how the pandemic has really impacted them. So there's many other organizations um, that we met with and spoke with, both listed here and not listed. Um, and we'll cover a lot of those ideas that we heard um, in some of the upcoming slides. First, um, I just want to touch on the survey results specifically. Uh, as I mentioned previously, the survey was available in multiple languages. We pulled all the results for, um, on August 15th to give us time to prepare for this meeting. And at that point, we had received nearly 1,900 responses, including 682 open-ended comments. So we had great participation. Um, that was really exciting to see. And I just want to highlight uh, these top three uh, response areas. It's probably difficult for, for some to see, but this third one it, that came in uh, third, ranked third highest is bolster nonprofit and social service agencies. And then coming in at one and two is addressing economic disparities in households and addressing health disparities in households. So these top two would fall into that first of the four broad categories I covered at the beginning of the presentation. Um, and that's also very reflective of what we heard in public input, as you'll see over these next uh, few slides. If you are interested in uh, wading through the raw survey results, we also did include those in the information packet last week, um, and they are also posted online at icgov.org slash ARPA. So these next probably 15 or so slides are going to review some of the major themes and ideas that we heard throughout all, all that we did uh, for this first phase of public input. Um, and again, this first phase, the, the intention was to identify what those emergent needs are and to start to pull out some of those priorities that, that we can start to shape the discussion around. So I'm going to throw a lot at you, um, but I'll try to move, them, move through them kind of quickly for the sake of time. Don't need to remember them all. Remember you have that list to re refer back to, but just want to give you a sense of what some of these recur recurring kind of themes and ideas were. So this first one on the screen is business support. We specifically heard a lot about um, support for BIPOC businesses. Um, we heard both operating and capital needs to help these businesses grow. The need for a commercial kitchen is one that came up um, through a couple of different avenues, especially at that diversity market to help some of those small vendors and businesses um, grow. 
Also heard financial assistance to continue to help small businesses as, the, as we weather these spikes um, in the pandemic. Next, child care, early childhood and youth. We heard a lot about the need for more accessible and more affordable child care. Um, this kind of could come through two ways. One, focusing on um, incentivizing providers, training new caretakers, um, making facility investments, or it could come through uh, focusing on the families, maybe providing stipends to, to low-income households to access child care. Along those same lines, we also heard calls for more before and after school programming, both expanded hours and more types of programming. Uh, we heard outdoor rec, programming for teens that's focused on skill building or preparing for work or earning some spending money. This last um, bullet you see, the fashion house, this is a concept brought uh, by a local entrepreneur which would teach BIPOC youth digital design, marketing, and business skills, and then would also serve as a place um, for these teens to go and feel safe and build community with one another. Housing and essential needs is next. Uh, this was almost constant that we heard uh, everywhere we went and, and everyone we talked to. We heard everything from direct checks to those who didn't receive federal stimulus um, to continuing or expanding our rent assistance programs, our home buyer programs. Um, home repair assistance was a big one that we heard, um, especially you know as financial pressures were put on households, they had to maybe divert their income to, to other needs instead. Uh, we also heard a um, suggestion of hiring a community navigator who could help immigrant and refugee residents access different programs and social services. Infrastructure projects, uh, this was actually a pretty common response in the survey. We did have a large group advocate for expanding affordable high-speed internet throughout the community. We also heard from a handful who recommended we focus these funds on some water and sewer projects that would benefit the community, um, such as a lead service replacement, pro I'm sorry, lead service line replacement program, or water, clean drinking water, stormwater management projects. Um, in the category of jobs and workforce, we heard ideas for upskilling the workforce, getting more diverse groups trained in certain industries and trades, and this could maybe come through a local jobs corps or pre-apprenticeship program or even through small business incentives. This next category, community development, neighborhood development, and crime intervention. This is kind of, again, a very broad theme area, but encompassed a lot of kind of similar ideas that we heard. The idea is to focus um, on a targeted neighborhood and that has traditionally maybe been underinvested in and, and focus on revitalization projects, bringing in neighborhood commercial businesses, focusing on home ownership in the neighborhood, having more community building events, and then kind of along those same lines, um, using some funds to invest in a violence intervention or gun violence prevention program. Um, which could come through a variety of ways, such as investing in wraparound services to help kind of interrupt those patterns of, vi of violence. Um, relying on strengthening our existing social service networks, this was another common theme. Um, what we heard here was both recognizing that there are some emergent needs that these nonprofits have to continue to serve at the, 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 at the higher level that they have throughout this pandemic but also using some of these funds to be more strategic and make some investments uh, long-term in how our social service network can uh, be more streamlined and perhaps fill some gaps. Um, we did hear a little about how the pandemic impacted individuals over 65. Um, we heard some suggestions of how we can continue to, to work towards our goal of reducing social isolation, whether that's through programming, um, we also heard other forms of need that this population has, transportation to such, such programming, scholarships to access memberships, um, and just assistance with uh, daily and household chores. Public health, this is another category that uh, encompassed a lot, but he, a couple of things that we heard. This first one, support for mental health services was a big one. Um, we specifically heard support for youth, non-English speakers, and people without insurance. Um, one, one way we could do this is kind of relying on and strengthening those existing crisis services that we do have in our community. 
Uh, next, we heard um, some support for uh, using some of the funds to continue to mitigate the COVID-19 virus. We heard support for expanding the Healthy Homes Program to include more services, to reach more households. Um, and then this last bullet here, we, we heard from people who have difficulty accessing medical uh, and preventative care due to a variety of barriers, whether that's language or lack of insurance. Um, kind of along that same line, we heard from a handful of people who have substantial unpaid medical bills, both from COVID, maybe it was incurred from the virus or, or during the virus, or it was these bills were incurred prior to the pandemic. But due to other financial pressures, um, they, had to, they had to focus on other needs and th those medical debts remain unpaid. Switching gears a little, we did hear from uh, many who expressed supports for arts, culture, tourism, entertainment, recreation, um, both financial assistance to help some of these nonprofit organizations stay afloat, as well as investing in, in more programming and events to bring people out and, and continue to work <coughs> on that economic recovery. We also heard support for uh, taking our climate actions even further. Um, I think the pandemic probably had people thinking a little bit about uh, just emergency preparedness in general because we received quite a few comments specifically on resiliency and d disaster preparedness. Um, taking a look at um, are we prepared for that next natural disaster, that flood, knowing that climate change could make it worse, um, and then identifying what steps we might take to, to be more prepared. Uh, following up on our transit study, we heard um, support for continuing to improve public transit in Iowa City, improved service, explore fare-free options, um, improve bus stop amenities and ADA access. And then this next one, one of the things that we did here, um, especially in our meetings with um, perhaps immigrants, is that some of, some of these individuals have lived in our community and worked here for over 30 years and they still don't have a path to home ownership. Um, so we heard a lot of really great um, and interesting ideas about how we might use these funds to address past disparities and help to um, support these under, traditionally underserved populations. So some of the ideas listed here are things like financial counseling, debt repayment programs, programs to help individuals build credit or equity so they can better, easier access a loan. And then on a larger scale, um, there were ideas such as exploring uh, community land trusts or agrarian reform. So that was a quick overview of, of kind of the major themes, and that's pretty reflective of um, that uh, summarized list that was in your information packet. Um, I know that was a lot, and I don't expect you to remember it all. So I, on this slide, I just want to quickly recap which of those ideas we heard the most frequently. So first, direct financial assistance um, is what we heard most frequently, specifically for those who um, did not receive federal stimulus checks or those additional unemployment benefits. Premium pay for frontline essential workers, affordable high-speed internet, long-term affordable housing, mental and behavioral health services, infrastructure projects, support for businesses and nonprofits, rent, eviction, and foreclosure assistance, a comprehensive nonprofit needs assessment, and enhanced public transit. So those are the, the ideas that we heard most frequently. And then, as I mentioned previously, uh, we know that additional public input opportunities will be necessary as spending decisions start to be made and as we start to focus these bigger concepts into more actionable ideas. Um, like I said, this initial p phase of public input, we viewed it um, as intending to help us identify what are those emergent needs and then what are these big priorities that we can start to kind of build the discussion around. I did want to point out um, a couple of kind of key pillars of collaboration, I'll call it, to kind of consider as, these, um, as we make spending decisions just to ensure that these funds are stretched as far as possible and have the greatest impact. So first listed is Johnson County. We have been working very closely with them, and they they are interested in continuing to collaborate. So we'll just continue to um, pay attention to how our priorities overlap uh, as they make decisions as well. Kind of along that same track, we have um, 
some really strong community partners who have an excellent track record in helping us carry out all kinds of different projects and programs. So it'll be important for us to keep in mind what partners would be uh, beneficial for us to work with uh, to help with implementation or efficiency or reach. And then if you recall my intro slides uh, and Jeff's mention of other ARPA funded programs, we know that this $3.5 trillion package is much, much bigger than the $18.3 million that's coming to Iowa City. So there's a lot of ARPA-funded programs um, that are still in development underway. We don't know when they're coming or what those details are. So we just need to stay nimble, stay flexible um, as we do receive those details. So that was kind of a, a, a big overview of uh, what we heard throughout this initial phase of public input. And I'm going to hand it back to Jeff. Thanks, Rachel. I want to um, talk uh, over the next two slides about the final two eligible use categories. If you recall back to Rachel's early slides, there's four eligible uses. Um, these came up a little bit during public input, but unsurprisingly, replacing lost um, uh, revenue from government and, and public infrastructure, you wouldn't expect those to necessarily uh, rise to the top of uh, a public input process, but nonetheless, I think it's important that council fully understand um, how you can operate within those two use categories. And my strong assumption is that most local governments throughout the throughout the country, uh, especially cities, will use most of their ARPA funds in these in these two categories: either replacing lost revenue or investing in infrastructure. Uh, again, that's just my my assumptions uh, based on what I hear uh, following city conversations on, on ARPA right now. Uh, so replacing lost revenue and restoring government service levels, the Treasury guidelines uh, are very specific in what is eligible and what is not. And they're also very specific on how you calculate what you would be eligible for. So we ran the numbers uh, for Iowa City, and we'd be eligible to use 10.3 million, that's about 56% of our allocation to replace lost revenue from the pandemic. And on a really high level, the way that's calculated is they look at your, your pre-COVID revenue numbers, and then they apply a growth factor, kind of a what would have been uh, type of scenario, and then they just subtract out what your actuals were during COVID. So that 10.3 number will actually probably grow. Uh, the feds allow you to recalculate that at different points in time during this granting process, so that number could grow. And the funds that were hit the hardest are, are listed there below, uh, wastewater, refuse, landfill, parking, road use tax. Those are the types of revenues that we could replace. So that could be unpaid utility bills, um, uh, less travel, so you had fewer road use tax dollars being generated, uh, and so on. Uh, the second category is the water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. Um, we certainly heard a lot about broadband, um, and uh, I'm not going to focus on that a whole lot. In Iowa City, we don't have municipal broadband. That suggestion has come up. Uh, several uh, counselors have been involved in those conversations over the years. Uh, and you'll know that to start a municipal broadband uh, service is going to cost well beyond $18.3 million. Uh, so we, we could hardly make a dent in rolling out a municipal broadband with this allocation. Um, we could uh, pursue some partnerships for free Wi-Fi and things like that, but these dollars wouldn't be stretched uh, very far going that route. On the water and sewer side, uh, certainly there is no shortage of public infrastructure projects that would be eligible. And as a reminder, our water and our sewer uh, programs are all self-funded, meaning the rates that we charge are what fund the improvements, the maintenance, uh, uh, and uh, ongoing services. So if we um, don't pursue infrastructure projects with ARPA dollars, those, those still have to happen, obviously, and those are on the backs of the ratepayers. We typically would borrow money or we would save up money, um, and that's reflected in the rates that we charge um, our households and our, and our businesses there. The top projects that we would urge uh, council to consider, if you want to use these funds for infrastructure, are listed at the bottom of the slide. We have an $8 million digester complex rehab at our sewer plant. Um, by pursuing ARPA funds, you could probably look at a rate decrease uh, in the community because we wouldn't have to borrow the $8 million to fund that renovation. And on the water side, we list about $10 million worth of improvements 
uh, in the collector wells and in, in, in our st on the storage side of things. That that last one, the nine million, that can actually be broken up into different trunks. So you could do a, a one million, a four, and there's two four million components to that. So that can be broken out a little bit. But if you decide to go down that path, these are the these are the projects that we would focus on uh, on the public infrastructure side. Okay, I'm going to get into our recommendations now. And I want to start by just reminding you and the public on the guiding principles that you set uh, back in June. Um, I won't read through all of these, uh, but just I want you to know that this, uh, these principles were certainly a lens that we looked through when developing uh, these recommendations. So we have a, a two-pronged strategy in terms of uh, uh, how we'd encourage you to approach this discussion. Uh, the first is to identify emergent relief needs and begin planning and executing on those. Uh, so those are the things that we need to spin up fairly quickly. Um, we need to quickly explore collaboration opportunities with our partners and hopefully get some of these, uh, if not all of them, uh, in action uh, by the end of this calendar year, which is no doubt an aggressive time frame uh, when you're dealing with federal funds, uh, but something that we would certainly put as our, as our target goal. The second piece is more strategic investment priorities. And that, those are, these are going to be uh, large topic areas uh, that we feel are worthy of significant ARPA investments. Um, but we're not here tonight to, to kind of recommend very specific uses of the ARPA funds. This would kind of be looked at as phase two of public input, where we would get stakeholders uh, together in these very specific areas and develop detailed plans and bring those back to you. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through the emergent relief uh, recommendations first. Number one is to direct one-time payments to income-eligible adults who did not receive federal stimulus checks or unemployment benefits. This is largely the undocumented population. This was widely supported throughout the public input process uh, in, in pretty much all of the different uh, uh, venues and ways we collected information. You've also had some boards and commissions uh, uh, provide you some recommendations on that particular use. Uh, we don't know how many people would be eligible just here in Iowa City, uh, but it's likely in the hundreds. And uh, again, uh, I strongly feel that we should, uh, if we go down this path, our first uh, uh, phone call, so to speak, should be with Johnson County General Assistance and really explore how we can use that system to execute on something like this uh, if the county would be so interested. The second recommendation for emergent relief efforts would be supplemental eviction prevention services. As I detailed earlier in the presentation, we've uh, spent about a million dollars this past year in eviction prevention services, um, and yet we know the problem isn't going away anytime soon, and with the federal moratorium uh, being rolled back, we can expect uh, even more challenges going forward. Uh, so these uh, uh, emergent relief funds would, would hope to sustain some of these new eviction prevention programs, uh, not only in the next year, but the next couple of years as the uh, COVID relief efforts uh, will continue. Um, and to be clear, this could be reinvesting in those same programs that we've already created, um, or it could be scrapping those and coming up with new ones. That's, that's the, a process that we would have to gather um, those that are executing on those services together to say, okay, what, knowing what we know this past year, what would work best? So we would come back to you with specific uh, uses for those funds. Rachel touched on this, but one of the things that we heard over and over again was the need for emergency uh, housing repairs. And uh, I can't tell you, we heard um, dozens of stories probably of people that uh, unfortunately had to put off critical housing repairs, life safety types of repairs, in order to pay for childcare, healthcare, uh, or other basic needs. And so this would be a program that we would uh, design and look for partners to execute on, which would provide some grants uh, for people that had, have had to delay uh, those necessary repairs. We would probably look through a, uh, for a third party to administer that. Um, or uh, we would have to bring on uh, some temporary staff at the city to execute on that. 
Um, and then there's also, you see the slash on that recommendation, relocation program, that's in recognition that unfortunately there probably are some living conditions that are beyond repair and that we need to have some serious conversations about uh, just providing relocation assistance to. And while this would be a, a citywide program, um, uh, we definitely know council has heard over the years and, and certainly I've been involved in a lot of conversations about the very acute need at the Forest View mobile home park as well. So this program again would be citywide, but uh, I would expect a, a heavy concentration of need for this in that specific neighborhood. The fourth and final emergent relief uh, recommendation would be emergency nonprofit operating assistance. Uh, many agencies are still struggling to meet the increased demands and at the same time their volunteer numbers haven't uh, bounced back. So they're doing more uh, with, with a lot less. Uh, we saw the impact that our CARES Act dollars had this past year. Again, we had about 500,000, 600,000 in CARES Act assistance that went towards this type of need. Uh, and uh, I think it made a world of difference and, and to do that again, I think would have a similar positive impact on our nonprofit community. So this is a summary of the emergent relief efforts. Um, what's added to this slide is obviously the estimated funding range. Um, again, we're not, not, not here to, tonight to get your decisions on how much money to put in each category. I think as we move towards planning, we'll come back. But I wanted to provide you some sense of what I believe is the, the range in which uh, these programs need to be funded at to be uh, uh, effective and meaningful. The one to 1.5 million for direct payments to eligible adults. You can uh, play with the variables any way that, that, that you want to, but to give you a sense, uh, 500 people at $2,000 uh, would be the million and 750 people at $2,000 would be 1.5 million. Uh, depending on where, again, you set those variables, um, obviously we could control the dollar amount, um, we don't necessarily have a good way of giving you an exact uh, approximate on how many persons might be eligible for those direct payments. For the eviction prevention efforts, uh, we're suggesting one to two million dollars uh, in order to sustain those programs for another few years. Housing repair and relocation, 500,000 to 1.5 million. Again, you'd be looking at there about 50 uh, household repairs, averaging 10,000 each to get you uh, 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 to that number on the low end, about 150 at uh, $10,000 average grant on the high end there. So that kind of tells you how we developed that specific range. And then the emergency nonprofit assistance at 500,000 to a million, that's about, uh, depending where you're at in that range, one to two times what we did last year. Uh, so providing that similar boost uh, that we did with the, with the CARES Act funds. Now again, um, this, th th you're looking at this like it's only going to be an Iowa City program. I fully believe that there will be some overlapping priorities when it comes to the county, uh, perhaps with the state too. We've seen the state roll out eviction prevention programs. So just keep in mind that these are initial, that they're meant to be flexible, and as we learn more about other programs that come out, some of these numbers go, may, may, may drop off completely and uh, get filled with some other gap, um, or at least be supplemented uh, with funds uh, outside of our control. Uh, moving on to the strategic investments, uh, there's a, a handful here that we'd like uh, to focus on going forward and get your feedback on. Really, uh, number one uh, is the BIPOC and underserved business support infrastructure. We heard a lot about um, the need to support uh, the uh, underserved businesses, uh, businesses that have had a hard time accessing capital, that have had a hard time accessing federal relief programs. Um, we uh, saw the success of the diversity market, and as we talked to those vendors, they said, we want this year round. We need a place to showcase what we can do. We need retail space. We'd love to have a commercial kitchen where we can expand our offerings and, and uh, provide them in an efficient manner. So this would look at that physical space. It, we have to define what that would be, but really investing in the space that will help uh, these businesses gr uh, not only start up, but grow. Um, this could include startup and expansion grants. 
Uh, we know that there's an ongoing effort to start a Schmidt in the South District. This could pilot that for a couple of years to try to prove its, its value and its worth. And it can also hire temporary staff to kind of manage this project off the ground uh, as, we, as we move forward. Um, one of the ideas that Rachel mentioned um, was a youth entrepreneurial community center type of uh, effort. Um, and, and that could certainly be in this category as well. So again, I just want to be clear on these bullet points. These are kind of examples of, of what can be done. I'm not coming here today uh, with the answers on exactly how these need to be funded, but wanted to give you a sense of what that next phase of public input would dive into. We would get the people around the table that are invested in this particular item and really allow them to take the lead on planning and help us understand what it could be that would help uh, the BIPOC and underserved business community. The second is a social service needs assessment and capital planning uh, and then uh, some seed funding to go along with that. So this would be a detailed analysis of current services with an eye towards enhancing collaboration and ensuring that we have sufficient capacity in our nonprofit sector uh, for the coming years. Um, that could be done, I think, ideally on a countywide level and not a citywide level, but uh, could, be, uh, could be done with recommendations formed and then we could set some, uh, some funding aside to fund those top recommendations. And again, it's really looking at beyond um, simple what you need today. It's really projecting out those needs in the future and figuring out how best we can address those as a community. Sometimes it's gonna be capital expenditures, might be a, a new facility or an expanded facility, uh, but other times it might just be identifying ways in which nonprofits can work together. So I think this could have uh, benefits well beyond uh, informing us how to use ARPA uh, dollars. It could, it could really help the nonprofit community work well together. It could help them in their own fundraising efforts. And certainly as we fund nonprofits through CDBG and home programs, could help guide those processes in the future as well. The next two are affordable housing initiatives. Um, I don't think that probably comes as a surprise uh, to the council, but we heard a lot of need for permanent supportive housing projects. I'm very interested in pursuing uh, community land trust consortiums in the community uh, to see if we can get something like that off the ground. Uh, strategic acquisition partnerships. Uh, this would be really with an eye towards avoiding uh, sudden displacements and maintaining uh, much needed affordable housing in the community while at the same time improving uh, living conditions. And uh, we also heard a lot of calls for financial counseling services and, and helping people achieve home ownership through down payment assistance. Mental health services, uh, we believe that there's some real possibility to bolster the local mobile crisis uh, service program, which is something that the council's uh, focused on a lot over this past year. We think we can make considerable improvements in response time uh, to that service, which would uh, enhance reliability, predictability, and help those in need, as well as our uh, law enforcement um, grow in its collaboration with the, with the mobile crisis team here. Youth services is something that we would need to dive into a lot, but we heard a lot about investing in youth mental health services. And then also, as Rachel touched upon, that senior population and fighting that social isolationism. We found some great success right in this building. And, and the staff here did an amazing job of reaching out to people that were otherwise not able to uh, uh, really get out of their home and socialize with anybody. And I think we've seen the power of that. And, and with a little bit of investment in, in technology here, we think we can have a, a really meaningful, um, make a, a meaningful difference uh, to our um, uh, elderly uh, population, particularly those that, that may be homebound. Uh, the next piece is workforce development. Uh, the trades and labor organizations, UI um, uh, Labor Center have some great ideas about uh, creating some expanded pre-apprenticeship programs for underserved populations. Uh, we are uh, very interested in continuing our efforts to build uh, the child care capacity in the community and uh, specifically the home child care uh, opportunities that are here. And then we've heard a lot of calls for uh, fare-free transit. And while we can't do that long-term, we can use some of these funds uh, to at least uh, move us forward in that direction and offer a pilot program uh, for a, a period of a few years. Uh, there's definite risk to doing that. The council has been a part of those discussions. It's hard to take those things away once you invest in them. 
but we certainly have an opportunity to to uh, better understand what the impact of a fare free system would have on people's lives here climate resiliency and hazard assessment planning um, you know, we have some of the leading global experts right here in our community that we haven't tapped into and I think there's a real opportunity to partner with the UI Flood Center and, and College of Engineering to really forecast our climate impacts on our infrastructure and our existing land use patterns here in Iowa City and hopefully throughout Johnson County so that over the next several decades we can make even more well-informed decisions uh, when it comes to investing in our infrastructure. Um, I think that would be a uh, critical step forward for us in addressing the climate crisis that council declared. The last uh, couple strategic investments are um, small business arts, culture, and tourism investments. Uh, there definitely uh, is a need for continued investment in uh, um, that employment base. Uh, this is one that I don't think would take a significant amount of ARPA funds because uh, we think that there will be uh, likely other programs from the state uh, that come out to support the, the business community. But we also know that through this past year, because we've provided some grants, that there are a number of businesses, particularly very small businesses, that did not access federal funds, that did not have the expertise and the assistance and the technical capabilities to access those funds. And those gaps still <coughs> exist, and those are important employers uh, in our community. Lastly is the public infrastructure and city revenue replacement. I do believe there is some room for this in our ARPA allocations. Again, we would look to uh, take some of that infrastructure cost off the ratepayers and forestall any needs for uh, a utility rate increases in the future. So I'm going to summarize that strategic investments. Uh, there's uh, eight of them right there. Um, and again, some estimated funding ranges. The BIPOC business support uh, infrastructure, these are really helping underserved business community get into a position where they can build that, um, build those businesses up, build that generation wealth uh, that, that is talked about in the Treasury guidance. Uh, because you're talking about physical space here and buying space, uh, it's going to be a more expensive endeavor. Uh, we've, we've put that estimated range in about four to six million. The social service needs assessment and capital planning. Uh, the, the assessment itself certainly wouldn't be measured in millions of dollars, but we know that the recommendations will likely have uh, some high price tags on them, particularly if it comes to looking at how nonprofits may collaborate and share space. Um, you can think back to the 1105 project and other <coughs> collaborative examples in this community that have had a real impact. That's the type of impact that we'd be looking for uh, with this study and these funds. Affordable housing initiatives, uh, you know, this could be as, as, as great as you want it to be. Six million does not solve our affordable housing uh, uh, challenges in this community, but it certainly at the high end of this range could um, provide a, 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 a lot of momentum uh, with some real positive projects there. I won't go through the rest of them, but you'll see they progressively get smaller as you go down. Um, at, at the bottom, uh, I'll point out the public infrastructure and city revenue replacement we would look at about one to three million dollars there. So um, when you total all those up on the left hand column, it's about 15 million dollars and on the right column, it's 32 million dollars. So obviously we're, we're providing you a, a range of funding that goes well beyond our capabilities, but also acknowledges that we have an opportunity to leverage dollars with the funds that we have. So you don't have to think about this just as that 18 million. Hopefully other governmental bodies will identify some of these same priorities. And that's when we really have to, to strike fast and really look for those partnerships. This is a summary of the two slides um, together. <laughs> So nothing new on this slide other than to see them all on one screen. At the very bottom, you'll see that estimated expenditure range. So all the left-hand columns would be about 18 million. So if we did operate in a vacuum and we just wanted to go do our thing, uh, you could fund the left-hand column uh, on all of these. Um, and then on the right-hand column, we're up to 38 million. Uh, and, and certainly that could be pushed higher in just about any one of these categories. But uh, that's where we uh, landed here. Okay, uh, before we uh, get it uh, to you for discussion, um, I want to just do a, a couple more reminders. 
Um, I know you're seeing recommendations. I just want to again stress that um, we need to be flexible. Um, we, are, we, we are largely the first out of gate with some of these uh, recommendations, and you have to expect that things will change. We know the health uh, situation is changing, the economic impact that uh, COVID is having could certainly evolve, uh, new federal programs, decisions by local governments, all those things. The Treasury is still updating guidance from time to time. So um, just be flexible and know that uh, it's going to be a fairly fluid process in these early months. And then also, Council um, should expect that a portion of these funds will go towards grant administration, whether that's the city hiring some folks to make sure that we're able to keep up with federal granting requirements and do the necessary audits uh, with our subrecipients, or if we're contracting with uh, partners to provide services on our behalf, that they are getting administration, administrative dollars to add to their staff team to be able to execute on those, on those programs. All right, and then uh, that's, uh, you know, we're looking for your direction right now. Um, Anything that we talk about um, is, you know, still has to come back to you for final approval. So there are no specific programs here. You're not taking any, any hard votes tonight. Um, but we want to know if we're on the right track. We want to know if, if you were really uh, hoping to see something that's not on this list, uh, or if there's something on this list that you frankly don't think that needs the uh, priority level that, that I've given it here. Uh, to let us know and we can continue to, to work with these. But what's really important is once we get your, your buy-in, that we can confidently go to the community and say, okay, now we've got this more detailed level of planning to take place. Because the last thing we want to do is sit down with the nonprofit community and say, we think we're going to have probably that four to five, six million somewhere in there, and then for that to kind of be taken back. Uh, over time. So we need to have some sense of confidence from the council that these priorities um, are your priorities uh, so we can begin that detailed planning. And the other thing you'll want to focus on is, uh, you know, what, what conversations uh, do you need in order to uh, have that comfort level? If you don't have that comfort level tonight, that's fine. Uh, just let staff know what we can do. If it's supplemental information, if it's helping set up a joint meeting with other governments so you can uh, better understand where they're at in the process, we're happy to do that. So with that, I'm going to leave it on this slide. and it's a little difficult to see, uh, but Rachel and I will answer any questions uh, that you have and look forward to your discussions and deliberations. Thank you, Jeff and Rachel. Lots of information. Um, I know that counselors do want to respond to this, so... I'll just say jump right on in there. Anybody that want to respond? Uh, I just want to say this is great. I, I think, Jeff, you cover a lot of needs in the community. And this is really, really good skeleton to start with. Uh, yes, my question is, I know that you said many times this is just like, you know, it's not like finalized and a more detail will come. But I want to make sure because in both summary, when you talk about how, like how is, let me put my glasses on, uh, like eviction and rent paid, you, you kind of said like only eviction prevention, not like full closure. Or, or in both summary, like recommendation, emergency relief summary, and the other summary. Is that just like, it happened to be there or because you did not receive any needs from homeowner on the survey? Yeah, so in that emergent category, we have eviction prevention. That could certainly be more expansive, and that's something that I think we, as we get into this next round of discussions with, with those that are uh, providing that service and understand the demand better than I, you know, I do personally, we, that could be expanded uh, to include um, more basic needs uh, in the community. So it does, it you know, clearly says eviction prevention here. That would be the main focus, but uh, that's easily expandable. Yeah, because like just from my experience working at the Center for Work, I guess is I've been filling out an application for a lot of people for mm -hmm. mortgage, whether for the IFA for, you know, or for the shelter house. There is definitely need for like homeowners help too as well, not only renter. 
I just want to throw that there. So. Yeah, and I, I think that's where we would really uh, want to have that conversation with Johnson County General Assistance as they've expanded that program to really understand um, what needs that they're seeing come through there. And obviously the Center for Worker Justice had a, a, a program earlier in the year that the, the city helped fund that provided mo more than just rent. It was, you know, whatever that most critical household need was. So we have some examples in the community of how that can work. And I'm confident we could uh, work through that on this as well. Yeah. My other comment will be for the council <laughs> that yeah, Jeff start the affordable housing. Uh, if I just add everything for housing, so whether it's like housing rent assistance, or if I add, uh, you know, repair assistance plus the affordable housing, <clears throat> it is around four million. And let us talk about this. Really, the affordable housing crisis is really, you know, something real in this community, and a lot of people being suffering from this all the time. The rent is really increasing right now. And even the people who have Section 8 voucher, they cannot find a house that like have the same you know, amount of the voucher because the market price is way high than the voucher that they get from Section 8. Uh, you know, this is crisis. We've been talking about affordable housing. I've been on the city council for four years. Uh, almost my term is over. And I don't see really, really like a, a solid plan for affordable housing. And 18 million is our opportunity to like really focus on that. We're not gonna find another opportunity like this. Mm -hmm. So if, if we can really think about affordable housing and give like more money toward affordable housing, and uh, there will be another, like a lot of opportunity, especially if the county help of uh, either put more money in affordable housing, or fund fully some of the program that we said, for example, like if the county decide to fund any of those like program fully funded so we can move that money around. But please, you know, I, I would like you guys to think about this, take the opportunity. This is our like really exciting opportunity for us to move forward with some solid plan about affordable housing and make that really more money. Uh, you know, I want to see like really more money in affordable housing. That's what I want to say. Thanks. I think staff has given us a, a great start here, and I like the the both the breakdown between the emergent needs and um, the strategic investments. Um, we need we need a plan that's going to help us as we go forward and build for the future. Um, things in there like the workforce development, the BIPOC business support. I mean, as Moz talks about housing, you know, housing is incredibly important, but people need a way to pay for it too. They need to be able to make money. And so increasing that assistance in terms of that workforce development and helping people with starting up and maintaining businesses. Um, I think all of us will look at this and um, would like to see more money. But I think also when we think about the fact that this is, we haven't had the real significant conversations yet with the county. Um, and others where we can hopefully have some overlapping <clears throat> priorities. Um, I think this is a great place to start. And I think, you know, as Jeff has said, we have to have a lot more conversation um, with the public, with the nonprofits, with the county, other municipalities, um, as we try to start moving forward and kind of dig into the details here. I had a couple questions about scope. Um, just as we were talking about the emergent needs and priorities and a number of them kind of fall within the housing. Um, and you had mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, Jeff, the $1.9 million in new or in, in relief efforts since um, kind of the beginning of the pandemic. And those are outlined as well. And a lot of those are, I think, tying into housing. Do you, do you have a sense, so f on the upper end of that, it, it, you know, some of this would be the more strategic investment over time and some would be the emergent if we're talking about housing. But I think um, the 1.9 of new programs, that money isn't all exhausted yet, right? 
No, it's it's all been um, allocated or or designated, but it hasn't all been exhausted. So, for example, we still have funds in our local eviction prevention program that the shelter house is administering for us, and we still have the courthouse eviction prevention program as as two examples. And then some of the money, for example, uh, money that we provided uh, some social services last year, have funded programs that are ongoing. Uh, so. Um, uh, while some of those programs have concluded, others are ongoing. So that money is, is still definitely working for us. And then we have our $1 million affordable housing allocation that the council's made the last couple of years. What percent of that is for emergent purposes or what dollar amount? It's 5% or 50000 Okay. Thank you. Do we have any idea how much remains in this in uh, that the state has to disperse for for people who are have who have rental and mortgage issues? I do not know what the status of the state is. I can say that the the payments um, have started coming in at a at a faster clip after a really slow start to that program. Um, we are seeing uh, um, more trickle into our water utility, which is how we can kind of monitor that. But um, I don't know what's left in the state. And, and, and I, I just wanted to note that one of the other big unknowns, and I think you mentioned it, but is there are two big bills working their way through in Washington right now. We don't, uh, we don't know what that's going to look like, but both the infrastructure bill and the $3.5 trillion budget that would include um, if it if it makes through it's going through markups right now if it makes it through it would include uh, big chunks of money for child care um, paid parent paid parental leave community college um, broadband uh, preschool and so forth and that those are those are sort of things that that will will know within a couple of months if that's actually going to happen That, that's a good point. Um, this is a very fluid situation in terms of where where funding could become available. It might uh, sweeten the pot, shall we say, in terms of what we can and cannot do with the funds that we have. I, I too, support the, um, the basic categories. Uh, I think they provide a pretty, pretty comprehensive framework in which to consider the use of the funds. Um, I also want to hope we can keep in mind the um, what was it the you know the popular themes that that Rachel went through the common themes over the various headings. I, I thought there were some really interesting ideas there uh, that fell under could fall under these categories that were presented at the end. Um, I. I'm, you know, we all probably have our preferences and focus points. I, I certainly think affordable housing uh, in terms of a strategic need is, is critical. Uh, but in looking at those common themes, questions of youth um, certainly are a concern of mine. Um, I also would want to emphasize, and I think it was found there in the themes, uh, that the use of neighborhood as a way to frame some of these initiatives as well. I, I think there can be a synergy when you place them within a particular place. Uh, and I think, again, the, 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 the level at which people struggle varies from place to place in Iowa City. So to the degree we can identify those places where people struggle, perhaps more so than in other neighborhoods, that might provide a way of, of thinking about how to apply these funds. Um, and, and the funds themselves in the different categories kind of working in concert with one another to advance things more rapidly. Um, that climate proposal, Jeff, I thought was sort of interesting. We do have an opportunity there to um, tap into the, the resources of the university. They're a great partner too in terms of our, our work on this and others. So yeah, I think it's a great first step uh, a lot of detail to be worked out. One last thing I would say is alternative funding sources. I know we had talked about the local option sales tax, and I think perhaps with this, you know, 
funding becoming available, we kind of put that on hold or on a back burner, but I don't know, I'm just thinking aloud here, but it seems like I wonder if, if thinking about them together might be a useful exercise. Uh, you know, we are the only major city in Iowa, the state of Iowa, as I recall, that does not have one. And, um, you know, for example, with these public infrastructure projects, you know, that, that is a, often a common use of a local option sales tax. Uh, so uh, maybe that's something to, to consider anyway, in terms of moving forward. I hadn't really thought much about uh, infrastructure and, and providing funding for infrastructure. I was leaning more towards uh, the public interest and, and helping, helping these folks out there uh, to prevent them from going even further into poverty uh, because I think that th there seems to be a possible downward trend that they'll just get further and further in debt if we don't help to give them a little leg up with, with things. And I think I'd like to thank Rachel and Jeff um, for helping to kind of consolidate these comments. It's, it's great that we got such a good response and from those people who, who it, it affects. So uh, that's good to know. And, and I think, and I'll be looking at some of those key things as far as housing and, and rental assistance and um, helping to rehabilitate some of the homes that are out there, those kinds of things, and health, helping them with their health. If I could add one thing is I've been grateful to see the the line item for housing repair slash relocation because there are there are set, there is a num there's a there's a there is housing including especially but not only Forest View that is seriously substandard, and where people just shouldn't be having to live through another winter. I guess when I look at this, I first say, wow, at all the ideas uh, that have come forth from the public input process. I also um, am disheartened by a lot of the needs in our community during this time. Um, I guess seeing it all in one space is, is a lot to digest as the needs uh, f with people um, from COVID, you know, there's been a lot of um, challenges that people have had. But when I do look at the list, I do find hope and, and opportunity, uh, really with the 18 million that were granted um, from the federal government, so thanks to them. There are so many great things about this when we look at, um, you know, the direct payment to eligible adults um, for those that were really excluded. Uh, from the most, <laughs> I, I don't know, this is the probably one of the hardest times in our lifetime when it comes down to um, a, a, a pandemic. I don't know if we'll see another one within our lifetime and the effects that it's had on people. And so uh, for those that were excluded, I think this is a great opportunity uh, that we can give to those individuals. I do agree that the housing, um, the, you know, the, if this was more um, categorized with everything that falls under housing, a couple of things that I want to look at is what is the short-term um, investment opportunities, such as, you know, maybe we um, pay somebody's rent, you know, to not allow them to be evicted. But I think some of the long-term investments is very important so we have a balance. Um, and that's where your affordable housing plan comes into play, where we are optimizing our opportunities with this fund to um, maybe work with other partners um, to expand our reach within affordable housing. I've said it before, Iowa City is such a desirable place uh, for people. Um, but some people just don't have the opportunity to live inside the city limits because the rents are not affordable, as well as the homeowners, uh, people who want to be homeowners. There's barriers, as we know, and I think this is an opportunity that we can have for those individuals. Um, I think uh, some direction to city staff might be beneficial from council. Um, we know that I've heard uh, people talk about partnerships with Johnson County to see how we can um, learn what they're doing and leverage some of our funds or even partner with them to administer some of our funds. 
um, especially if it's something that's going to be overlapping. We also know that there's things coming from the state um, and also from the federal government uh, that remains to be seen. So I I don't know what the best process or what what staff would find helpful, to, you know, from us today. Or have you heard enough? Well, I, I, I guess what I would say is our, our primary focus is going to be on the emergent needs category to, to get things started. Um, so our next step, if, if we see general concurrence here, which I, I think we do, is to sit down with the staff at, at Johnson County and share this with them, let them know that we're interested in this. And then we, we, we kind of have to let them move their process along. And I think we can do some planning behind the scenes why they move their process along. But ultimately, you know, that decision needs to be made by the Board of Supervisors. So um, I think we can have those initial conversations with staff. Um, I'd suggest we indicate an openness, not that we have to do it, but uh, to get a joint meeting between the board and the council um, once they get to their decision making process uh, so that, um, you know, things like uh, Mayor Pro Tem brought up, okay, is this eviction prevention or can we work together to expand that in some way? Just, just see where, where the thoughts align and uh, where, where, they, where they do. You, you, you move towards collaboration and if there's some divergence there, that's okay too. Um, we start to take some of those things on our own, but I know the county's anxious uh, to, to uh, move forward to some emergent items as well. It may be um, uh, uh, later in uh, October before they get to some of their decision-making moments, but uh, um, I think in the meantime, knowing that you're, you're comfortable with those four, we can, we can start to collaborate with their staff and take it as far as we can. Um, the other items, um, some will probably take a complete back seat and see no action for a while just because of our own staff capacity and others we might start advancing, uh, particularly those that might involve a study component. So like a social service needs assessment process, we may start to have some discussions to flesh that out because we know that the first step is going to be a study which may take, you know, eight to 12 months to, to complete. Um, so we want to get a little bit of a head start on that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. I did want to just add, at least for me, the public infrastructure mm -hmm. and city revenue replacement, I'm not interested in having that come be a part of this. Okay. Personally. Uh, that's the only thing that I missed. I was trying to agree with Bully and Taylor on this too. I, I just believe that, you know, uh, we can figure out this. The city always figure out budget for the infrastructure, and this is being we've been doing this forever. We don't have really that huge problem in the city. Uh, you know, maybe next budget we will budget this again to help if there is needs right now. But I think from this money, we need uh, you know to try to see what the public interest is and just allocate the money to it. I would just suggest that given that this is such a fluid situation and we don't know how much other money is coming, that we at least leave that in as a placeholder for now because we might really end up with money that will help us be on the very high end of these ranges or even higher depending upon additional money like Janice just mentioned. Um, so I would certainly encourage that for this point in time we at least leave that in as a placeholder. And I don't. I didn't mean to suggest by any means that the the needs that were shared is you know something that we should consider. So I do appreciate um, you know staff bringing that to our attention. So I don't want to make. I want to make sure that uh, there is no disrespect um, and full knowledge that we do. We we have a need, right? We certainly have a need. As far as the placeholder, at least for me, what I know is that. <laughs> No matter what, 18 million is a lot of money. It still isn't enough money mm -hmm. for our for our city. So, uh, not to provide false hope, um, I just you know think that we'll have another enough opportunity to invest other places with the 18 million. Yep, I agree. I guess I would just say that um, I definitely agree with the four emergent uh, recommendations. And we should maybe just take a moment to acknowledge the only reason we can even be talking about excluding revenue replacement and infrastructure is because of a long history of financial responsibility and reserve policies, thanks to our staff um, and our consistent decision making over time. So I personally, I don't think we should rule it out and hope that the, it can be filled 
um, through other federal funding sources that may come forward later. But I think things like, if we think of revenue replacement, right? Like the fact that our transit system revenue is down so significantly and we might need to put money towards um, boosting that to have fare free. I wouldn't want to exclude that given that I think that has a really important public benefit. Um, but I think it also would count as potentially revenue replacement. So I just, I, I think the flexibility piece is really really important. I also, um, I do think we should ask for a joint meeting with the Board of Supervisors, um, or at least find ways to convey our urgency. As Jeff noted, we're like the first ones, I think, to kind of be able to come out of the gate in, with these initial thoughts on our prioritization. And there's really significant efficiencies to be gained by having the county administer um, through the general assistance program, something like the direct payments. I just want to make sure that we're pushing that timeline as aggressively as we possibly can. So whatever we can do to help support that, encourage that, um, I think we need to be doing. I would agree. Yeah. <clears throat> I agree with Councillor Burgess. And, and, and also, I mean, it's we as a city, as, as Council Berger was saying, is basic, we're basically in a, in a position that not very many other cities are, including other cities within Johnson County, to be able to say, maybe we can probably get along without um, plussing up the city funds because we have had such responsible stewardship. And so uh, that's, uh, we're, it's a very fortunate position to be in. What I have not seen, or maybe I miss it, that I really want to see something about like COVID, you know, COVID nineteen vaccine to be like really reach out to the minority community who are not vaccinated. I don't know how we can do that, but sort of like number of the organization or anything. But we we need really to advertise that and reach out to be able to educate them and encourage them to go and do the vaccine. If we can spend some of the money uh, to like do like outreach or something like that will be great. I, I want to see something like that happening. Yeah, it certainly would be an eligible use for promotion incentives. Um, obviously, we didn't include it in our recommendations. Uh, doesn't mean that wouldn't be uh, supportive of it. Uh, the president uh, had, had put out a call about a month ago for $100 incentive program, local incentive programs to help boost numbers. Um, I guess my feeling on it would be, uh, you know, here locally, public health is a county operation. And because that's where the, the, the staff expertise lies, um, that we would leave that piece to the county should they want to go down that path. But certainly, if you wanted to set aside some funds in the emergent category or put some funds up there for vaccine incentives or marketing, um, we have the ability to transfer money to the county and ask them to help in executing that. Um, yeah. I, I would probably just wait and see what their priorities are when it comes to the public health matters. Sure. I just want to say that because we are always the leader yeah. and we did the mask mandate. We can do this too. Uh, I, I just believe that will be a good opportunity. I think yeah. along with that, that you know, one of the items was the diversity market and, and the South District is hoping that we can help them expand that. And I think uh, that was helpful. And I think they encouraged the vaccination at those uh, at that at diversity market. And, and so I think that would be one of the items top on our list is, is to help them with that. I mean, I think I think a vaccine component can be included in a lot of these programs. You know, if you're if you're getting if you're going to get emergency response, do you have the vaccine? Come, you know, get come get the vaccine. And I think it will be even more important when they finally roll out um, uh, vaccines for under 12s mm -hmm. to make sure that all, that there's an opportunity for the kids to get vaccinated as well. That's true. The other thing is, I think the business support um, is a very important thing that um, I think that's a long term investment, especially when we're talking about uh, the BIPOC uh, business infrastructure. Um, and so that is something that I would certainly be interested in. And I think, uh, you know, that smaller amount of 4 million, I, I do believe that that is, you know, 4 to 6 million is what's there. I think it will take that type of uh, um, investment to really make long-term opportunities um, that really does in the, in the end 
allow families to have more financial um, self-sustainabilities. Um, and really, I, I think when we're talking about um, generational wealth. I think that's one of the real thing I like it on this proposal. You know, it's really well done by the staff. Uh, and I think so from that uh, public recommendation, you come out with like four to six million. This is really good because I know there is a lot of need for buyback businesses. Uh, you know, a lot of people they would like to open due to you know business, their own businesses, but due to like really expensive rent and all these kind of things, they cannot do that. And I, uh, this is really well done ideas. And I, I believe uh, if we can really this come true and even four million uh, to six million if the county put like more dollar into it we can we can read the six million easily and, and do that this is great really I like it there's some potentially really good partners to bring to the table on that with some out-of-the-box ideas and not you know it's it's great to have businesses and but also think sort of incubator and uh, and youth and youth center and social and, and there's there are a lot of possibilities um, that we could put that could be put on the table along with that is the jobs and workforce development and partnering perhaps with the school district or even kirkwood community college doing that skills training and and uh, workforce and trade training programs i think is vitally important also to help these people get their feet back on the ground and and the young people to see a future mm -hmm. i did want to try to get a timeline as to what council is thinking as um our follow-up uh, with staff on this item because if we're saying by the end of the year uh, we're already in September we have one more meeting now so we have October November we know that in December we start to, well typically we start talking about what our budget um, individual budget initiatives might uh, be so staff have some knowledge but in December we start budget uh, conversations um, a little bit so Especially we talked about the idea of one meeting on December. I heard it before, but unless you guys can your mind, but this is, yeah, we need really to act fast on those kinds. Yes. Well, it seems to me the first thing is, as I think Jeff had mentioned, trying to set something, set up a joint meeting with okay. Board of Supervisors. Yeah. That's a good start. Okay. I believe the county has a uh, public hearing scheduled in late October, uh, which is when they're public input process at least this phase of it will wrap up and then they'll begin some early decision making processes so maybe that late october early november time frame is probably is, is going to be best and in the meantime we'll be talking with their staff rachel meets with them uh, on a weekly basis uh, their arpa team so um we'll we'll be as prepared as we can heading into that meeting does that sound okay, or did you want something sooner? I'm just afraid if we do it sooner, the, the other elected officials from the county may not be able to say a whole lot because they haven't concluded their process yet. Right. I think the county have a public hearing in October, so yeah. by I, that time they have, that, that's their last one, I guess. I, so by that time they will be ready to make a decision. Yeah, I think that's late October. <clears throat> yeah, late October. and. Maybe we just work on the fine details during that time. Because right now, I really don't know. Uh, you, you ask us on the recommendation, like the how, how much, I think, let me see. The question was, yeah, you said like balance of the estimate funding allocation. And that's something we have to do now, we'll do it later. And also, like given the fact that we we allocate some money during the summer the last year and now we keep the city had really allocated a lot of money to our residents for rent and you know help for utility and rent but we gain a lot of experience from that we saw the challenges we saw like how a lot of people cannot really uh, easy access those money what the challenges was how we can avoid all those challenges next time so i think we need that's why we need to talk about this like when it comes to who is eligible how we can access this money uh, who should receive the like not like who should receive the fund but how much is it and all these fine details I don't know, is that the staff going to do, or the city do, or going to have committee, 
or how are you going to do that? Well, it may be different for each one. I think for the emergent items, um, my uh, preference would be to work directly with the county where there is overlap and come to you with very specific recommendations on, on what that looks like and then allow you to, to, to make changes to those. Um, but you are correct, we've learned a lot. We've had a lot of discussions about uh, uh, required documentation, self-certification, all those types of things. I have a pretty good feeling on where you all stand on that. Um, and uh, again, we just have to sit down with the county and see where their comfort level is and hopefully it lines up. And if not, we may have to do a, a separate program. That's good, I, yeah. Just in terms of order of, of operations, I think a logistics question that hopefully we could answer before their final public hearing would be, if we want to inject this money into the general assistance program, how quickly can we roll it out? I mean, because is there even a possibility for them to administer something that's only for Iowa City residents? I realize that would be very unusual, but I, I would like to know the answer to that question because we need to know that in terms of would we want to do something separately? Correct. That's and ex also, exactly what we could be working on in the meantime. Thank you. And to add to what Real Council Berger said, not only just like, yeah, can they do that? Also, do that? They have the necessary like really uh you know translation how the people who really how they're going to administrate this is this like could be in person because what they need all the low-income people they like in person so they can talk and they can and do they have somebody to translate that uh, i really think we need to make this really easy for the public to access it we are not here to save this money we, we have this money to distribute it to the community. We learn a lot during the pandemic. We, we, we start doing a lot of challenges we never heard of during that time. So I think we need to take all those things that we learn. And when we want to give this money to any of the, whether it's like number of the organization, whether it's to the county, we have really to talk about that. Any other comments on this topic? Just the, with, re, with respect to the, the one emergent item of, of housing repair and relocation, I think it would be really helpful for us to have as much granularity on that and have it as, as, as well laid out as possible so that because, you know, that a lot, every, everything that's emergent is emergent, but winter is coming um, and people will need, will need to find a way to get them assistance quickly. Just was that comment, you know, last comment. I really want to shout out to the staff. Really, this is this is great. I I really like this proposal, and uh, as I said, it's a very good skeleton. We can add to it, and when we talk to the county, and we still I think we're receiving public input too. You know, I I just encourage you if you receive like a lot of people talking about thirteen thing that we we never added here to bring it to our attention, so we can add it. We still have time, and we can add as we go. All right, well, thanks for everybody input here and thanks to staff again. We are on to the next item, which is clarification of agenda items. This is for the formal agenda. Hearing none, we'll go to info packet discussions for August 19th. Info packet August 26th. Just would draw people's attention to IP uh, 3 and 4, the 
um, 2020 racial equity report card has some always very interesting statistics and the social justice and racial equity second quarter report has a lot of information about activities uh, in the city um, along for those programs. FO packet September 2nd. I think on this we need to talk about the meeting schedule or I'm not right. I don't know. I don't know one. Yeah, we can certainly. So I know that um, did we want to wait closer to the to the end of the year? No, for the where is the meeting? It's still gonna be here because okay. yeah, that's the last time. Uh, they said this is the last one. I think though. Okay. Yeah, let me see this. Okay. What are people? What are counselors' comfort level? I think we should stay here. I agree. I mean, things I have gone worse, not better. We're back with a mask mandate. Um, mm -hmm. It would really, it'd be almost impossible for us to be distanced, and it would even limit more the amount number of public that could come into council chambers so I think we should stay here for now I yeah, know it's it's a burden for staff but really it's uh, this this is a place where where it feels safe where we can have face-to-face -face conversation as well as have the public in mm -hmm. seem like we have a, a majority of I agree yes I agree mm -hmm. okay anything else all right um, council updates on assigned boards, commissions, and committees. I haven't met. <laughs> no means. Nothing. We will be adjourned into our 6 p.m. formal meeting. We will see you in about 30 minutes.